Help give kids an extra life by donating today to help sick and injured children. Link in the description and pinned comment below. Team Awakened Orochi! Okay, I've seen this before. Team Samurai! Oh sweet! Now Sam shows in KOF for real, that's pretty cool. Okay, that was announced earlier. They're back. They're back! Wow, to think it's been nearly 25 years since we last saw this franchise in action. You think Mega Man fans have been starving? The Wolves have been absolutely famished, people! But now, with Fatal Fury City of the Wolves deep in development, Fans of SNK are ready and raring to return to the mean streets of Southtown, where the Neo Geo's fighting game legacy all began. Yeah, if it wasn't for Fatal Fury, or Garo Densets as it was called in Japan, the King of Fighters and its 3-on-3 -three -three mayhem wouldn't even exist. But now, the story of Terry, Rock, and all the others is returning to the forefront, and the SNK faithful are excited. I mean, Terry's inclusion in Smash Ultimate was quite a big deal. But why is this game such a big deal? You want to hear the tale, don't you? The Legend of the Wolves. Let's go way back to where it all began, with the first game, Fatal Fury King of Fighters. Not to be confused with the series called The King of Fighters, that's a different yet related franchise. This game was being developed around the same time as Street Fighter 2, you know, the game that would revolutionize fighting games. Interestingly enough, the designer of the game, Takashi Nishiyama, was the creator of the original Street Fighter. Yeah, without this guy, there would be no Memphis reset, no legendary Tokido run, no Let's Go Justin! But sometime after Street Fighter's release in 1987, he would leave Capcom to join SNK. He envisioned Fatal Fury as a spiritual successor to Street Fighter, but he wanted to create a meaningful storyline and characters that were easier to empathize with, something that he couldn't achieve with Street Fighter. At least, not at the time. So the story centers around Terry and Andy Bogard, two orphans from Southtown who were adopted by a martial artist named Jeff Bogard. A few years after, though, Jeff was murdered by his rival, the ruthless crime lord Geese Howard. The boys knew that taking on someone like Geese would be suicide for a couple of street rats, so they devoted their lives to training themselves so that one day they would be strong enough to take him down. Terry combined classic street fighting with the art his father learned, Hyakkyo Kuseiken, while Andy would train in Shiranui-style ninjutsu as well as a barehanded style called Kopoken. Years later, the brothers returned to Southtown to honor their father, where they met and befriended a Muay Thai champion named Joe Higashi, who told them that Geese was organizing a tournament in Southtown called the King of Fighters. Seizing an opportunity to finally avenge their father, they set out for the tournament. And thus, the story begins. The game itself would release in November of 1991, several months after the release of Street Fighter II. So let's pop a quarter in the slot and start this baby up! So those three characters I mentioned? Yeah, they're the only characters you can pick. Pretty slim pickings compared to Street Fighter 2's playable roster, which was, uh, how many again? Pretty sure that makes eight. So once you pick your character, you select your first opponent from Duck King, a street dancing fighter, Richard Meyer, a capoeira fighter who runs a local restaurant, Michael Max, a boxer who clearly takes after Mike Tyson but is just different enough to dodge a lawsuit, and Tung Fu Ru, Jeff's former master who goes from stereotypical old master to... Okay, this guy looks way too much like Master Roshi on steroids. Now like Street Fighter 2, matches are best of three, but with a simpler control scheme of punch, kick, and throw. There's also an interesting gimmick here. Fights take place on two lanes, the background and the foreground. You can move between these two planes to evade attacks and attack back. Here's the problem with this first game, though. In the one-player mode, only the computer can switch between planes at will, meaning you would have to either brace from an incoming attack from the other plane, or pursue them onto theirs. After every two fights, you would have a bonus stage in the form of arm wrestling a machine, which is just button mashing. 
So after you beat the first four challengers, you face Hua Jai, who combines Muay Thai with Drunken Fist, Raiden, a notorious heel wrestler and not the guy from Metal Gear Rising, and finally, Geese's right-hand man, Billy Khan. Oh, wait, 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 wait. It's pronounced Khan? He wields a cane. His name is spelled cane, but with a K. And it's pronounced Khan? Khan! If they've been lying to you about how this guy's name is pronounced, what else have they been lying to you about? So after you finally beat Billy Khan, Khan! You're technically the champion. Except almost immediately you're dragged up to Geese's tower to fight the big dude himself. And this guy is patient zero for the disease known as SNK Boss Syndrome. Between his mobility advantage, his devastating counter grab, and his repuken, or should I say, rep broken, he is a test to the hilt. But eventually you get the satisfaction of knocking him off the balcony to his apparent death. But more likely you'll see it happen to your character more often than that one meme. Well, there's no point in hiding it. The first game jank is real here. For one thing, like I said, only the computer is able to freely take advantage of the two-plane system in the single-player game, which gives the computer a huge mobility advantage on two-plane stages. But here's another odd quirk. When a second player joins the game, instead of going right to a versus match, the second player joins in the current fight, making it a two-on-one. It's pretty clear why this never caught on. As for the gameplay, it's definitely a solid foundation, but you can definitely tell that it feels different from Street Fighter 2. Instead of combo execution, fights can come down to well-timed special attacks as evidence from the gameplay system of one punch, one kick, and a dedicated throw button. And it may just be a me thing, but it didn't feel like knockout blows had much of an impact. You see the move connect, you see the damage, but it looks like it flies right through the opponent. Minor gripes aside, the standard gameplay is satisfying enough for a first attempt. As for the presentation, they did a good job. The sprites for the characters look pretty damn good. There are some really expressive animations, and the special moves looked cool. So did the backgrounds, by the way. The backdrops really made Southtown feel lived in. People in the background, billboards, buildings, all that good stuff. And I really appreciate how there's a sense of time here. The scene goes from daytime, to twilight, to a night between rounds. And that's really cool. So while there is some early installment weirdness that would later be worked out, the first Fatal Fury game had a good foundation that later games would improve upon. It would get a remake in the form of Fatal Fury Wild Ambition in 1999, which was the last game to use the Hyper Neo Geo 64 arcade board, and the only such game to get a home port, but it went largely unnoticed in the 3D fighting game boom. Now just as Street Fighter 2 was a monumental improvement over the original, it stands to reason that a Fatal Fury sequel would also improve. And in 1992, Fatal Fury 2 was released as the second game in SNK's 100 Mega Shock series, boasting much improved graphics and gameplay over the original. For one thing, the control scheme was changed to a two-punch and two-kick system, offering more attack variety. The two-plane system was also improved in that not only could you jump between planes at will, you could knock your opponent between planes as well. Another new gameplay addition was a game-changer, Desperation Attacks. When your health was critical, you could perform a super move which was difficult and risky to pull off, but did a huge amount of damage if it connected. As for the roster, it also expanded with five new playable characters. Well, kinda five. Big Bear is just riding after a face turn. The other newcomers include Cheng Sin Zan, a Tai Chi master hoping to open his own training hall, Jubei Yamada, an elderly judo master, and two future SNK staples. Those being Kim Kap Hwan, a Taekwondo master from South Korea, and Mai Shiranui, a Kunoichi who, whoops, I forgot this video was for good boys and girls. This is along with four bosses, those being Billy Khan, 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 who's back for revenge, Axel Hawk, a retired boxing champ, Lawrence Blood, a fighter who used to be a matador, and the big man behind this second tournament, Wolfgang Krauser a German noble who staged this whole thing to find the man who defeated Geese, who, by the way, is his half-brother. And you know this man is a big deal because he has his own personal orchestra, who plays an arrangement of Dies Irae from Mozart's Requiem in D minor to accompany his fights. The game was very well received as a strong improvement over the original, thanks to its improved gameplay and excellent visuals. The scrolling backgrounds were really well done. Terry's train stage became iconic enough to return for KOF 14, and then, in 1993, a definitive edition was released called Fatal Fury Special, which brought back Duck King, Tung Fu Ru, and Geese, as well as making all the bosses playable. And as a cherry on top, if you went 2-0 in every match, you'd get to fight Ryo Sakazaki from Art of Fighting in a special match. 
This actually helped pave the way for the King of Fighters series, which all began in 94, kept on rolling in 95, the beasts were in place in 96, and that's a story for another video. And by the way, yeah, about geese... I'm not dead! If you want to know how geese survived a fall from a skyscraper, the answer is, of course, ancient evil magic! Turns out he possessed an ancient scroll called the Phoenix Scroll, which boosted his recovery rate to insane levels. It also turns out there are two more, which are a set of three that were written during the Jin Dynasty in China. And when combined, they're said to grant immortality. And Geese isn't the only one after the scrolls, which brings us to a rather divisive entry in the series. Fatal Fury 3, Road to the Final Victory. This one came out in 1995, a year after the King of Fighters 94, thus marking the beginning of a split continuity. With Geese's return, the action returns to Southtown, and this is where the series' art style had its first really big evolution, with improved sprites and backgrounds for each location in town. The gameplay also expanded on the original formula, changing from a two-plane system to a three-plane system. You can move to the background or the foreground, but you can only jump or use special moves on the center plane. As for the roster, apart from Geese and the main trio, Mai makes a return, along with five newcomers. The new challengers are Blue Mary, an undercover agent who becomes a friend-slash-love interest of Terry, Bob Wilson, a student of Richard Meyer from the first game, Franco Bash, a mechanic who was a former kickboxing champ, Han Fu, a detective from Hong Kong on the trail of a drug ring, and Sokaku Mochizuki, a Buddhist monk who's part of a clan that's rival to the Shiranui. And there's also the matter of who Han Fu was after. The character in question would become another SNK mainstay, Ryuji Yamazaki. Gangster, weapons dealer, drug trader, certified psychopath... Oh, and in the KOF timeline, he's one of the Hakeshu, the servants of Orochi. And a recurring bad guy. In this timeline, however, he's been hired by the main villains, Jin Chon Shu and Jin Chon Rei, who themselves are possessed by their ancestors, who want the scrolls thinking that having all three will allow them to obtain new immortal bodies and, you guessed it, take over the world. Of course! No, Bison, this is not your franchise! Back the f*** off! One thing I forgot to mention is that this game grades your fighting performance, and you need high marks to even fight Sean Ray. Now, while the evolution of the gameplay was generally well-received, the smaller roster left a bit of a bitter taste in some fans' mouths, which would be addressed in the following title. That would be Real Bout Fatal Fury, which was released in 1995. Turns out that in the end, Geese managed to obtain all three of the scrolls, only to have them disposed of so that they couldn't be used against him. Now I get where Kaiba got the idea. Anyways, now he's back in power in Southtown, and he set up another King of Fighters tournament to settle the score with the Bogard brothers. Everyone from Fatal Fury 3 is back for this one, and Duck King and Kim Capquan return as well. Now, you may have seen the words Real Bout on some of the set pieces from the first game, and I have no clue what exactly they mean, but here we are. The button layout has changed yet again, this time with a single punch, a single kick, a power attack which depends on the character, and a dedicated button for moving to the background or foreground, or attacking an opponent who's on one of the other planes. Another key change to the gameplay is the addition of barriers on the sides of the stage. If you get knocked into these barriers one too many times, they'll break like my temper when fighting base double X, leaving you open to a ring out. Yeah, you don't see ring outs too often in 2D fighting games. This is also where super meters were introduced to the franchise. These allowed for guard cancels, which used half a gauge, and two types of super moves. S-Power was the standard type of super moves, but if your gauge was full when you were at half health or lower, you could perform a hidden P-Power super move, which dealt a ton of damage. There are three fights at each venue this time around, with a cutscene following every third battle, leading up to the final fight with Geese. This game was built as Geese's last stand, and canonically, it sticks. In Terry or Andy's ending, Geese gets knocked off the balcony again, and despite Terry or Andy reaching out for his hand, Geese decides he'd rather die with his pride. Now, while this was the best-looking Fatal Fury game to date, it still looked a little lackluster compared to other fighting games at the time. Nothing against SNK, it's just that this era was freaking stacked for fighting games. One thing I will knock it for is the music. A lot was imported from 3, and the new tracks just sounded banal at best and obnoxious at worst. At least the gameplay was where it shined. The refinements of 3's system made this an improvement over the previous title. And on a side note, it had the most hilariously despairing Game Over announcer I'd ever seen. Game Over! The real bout line would continue for two more non-canon games. The first, real bout Fatal Fury Special, would hit arcades in 1997. 
Returning to a two-plane system and replacing the ring outs with getting stunned if you got knocked into a breaking barrier, the game also brought back four veteran characters, those being Tung Fu Ru, Cheng Sin Zan, Lawrence Blood, and Wolfgang Krauser, reprising his final boss role from Fatal Fury 2, and again, his theme was a reference to Mozart's Requiem in D minor, this time being the Lacrimosa movement. Krauser sure likes his Mozart, doesn't he? And while Geese is canonically dead by this point, a hidden boss fight in this game proves that his shadow still lingers in the form of Nightmare Geese. And even after he loses, he still can't help but laugh like a maniac. Another thing to note here is that the announcer is pretty chatty compared to what we normally see from the gig. Here, let me show you an example. Hey, how's it going, dude? And left again. Dude, your favorite character. There would be an enhanced port released for PlayStation in Japan only, subtitled Dominated Mind, featuring two new characters. Those being Alfred, a young pilot who serves as the protagonist, and White, the new main villain who was designed after Alexander Delarge, the main character from the dark comedy novella A Clockwork Orange, as well as Stanley Kubrick's movie adaptation. The game would be followed by real bout Fatal Fury 2, The Newcomers, in 1998. The newcomers in question are Rick Stroud, a Native American boxer, and Li Zhang Fei, a Chinese-American waitress slash bodyguard. Also, this game is where Alfred actually made his debut as a hidden boss. Gameplay maintains the two-plane system, however, there are a few stages which are restricted to a single plane, limiting your options and forcing you to adjust accordingly. The barriers on the sides of the stage have been removed completely as well, taking away some of the advantage of cornering your opponent. This would be the last real bout game, and the last arcade game in the series to carry the Fatal Fury name. That's because the following game would be vastly different than any in the franchise before it. So the ten years following the death of Geese Howard ushered in an era of relative peace for the rechristened Second South Town. That is, until Geese's brother-in-law, Kane R. Heinlein, decided to make a move. Turns out he has his eye on Geese's estranged son, Rock Howard, who had been raised by Terry, and in order to draw him out, he's holding a brand new tournament called King of Fighters Maximum Mayhem. Thus, the stage is set for the best the series has seen to date, Garo, Mark of the Wolves. Released in 1999, this is widely seen as the pinnacle of the Fatal Fury series to date, though it only inherited the Fatal Fury name with the Dreamcast home port. Seen as a new generation entry to the series, I'm pretty sure the name was changed so that people didn't get confused when they saw a radically different fighting system. Gone was the multiplane fighting stages, and in its place were two key systems. The first was Just Defend, which grants several benefits to blocking an attack with near-perfect timing, like health regen, guard cancelling, and more. The other was Tactical Offensive Positioning, or T.O.P. for short. You select a segment of your health bar, and while your health is within that segment, you get increased attack power, health regen, and access to a powerful special move. The roster also got a huge shakeup as well. Terry was the only veteran in the cast, and aside from Rock, the new protagonist, there was a mix of completely new fighters, such as Pirate Lady B. Jenny, Hawk-themed Luchador Tizak, and serial killer Freeman, as well as characters related to SNK veterans, such as Kim Kapwan's sons, Kim Dong Hwan and Kim Jae Hoon, Hokuto Maru, the disciple of Andy Bogard, and Kyoku Genryu student Marco Rodriguez, whose name was changed to Kush Nude Butt for the American release. There are also two boss characters, those being the imposing Grant and the aforementioned Kane, who you only get to fight if your grade is high enough. This guy won't take on just anyone, you know. Now, aside from the much improved gameplay systems, which reward tactics and reaction more than usual, the presentation in this game is amazing. The graphics are pushed way beyond most games on the Neo Geo, with incredible backgrounds and character sprites, and awesome character themes. Funny thing, there was actually planned to be a sequel back in the early 2000s, and it was reportedly about 70% complete, before it was canned due to SNK's financial situation. They went bankrupt a couple years later. I got better? So yeah, SNK has been back for a while, after having been through all sorts of business changes and whatnot, bringing back the King of Fighters, Samurai Showdown, and at EVO 2022 they finally announced that a new Fatal Fury game was in development. And a year later, the full announcement was unveiled for the new Fatal Fury, giving it the most dope-ass subtitle ever, City of the Wolves, and teasing the return of several series veterans. And a new trailer dropped at this year's SNK World Championship, fully showing off the game's awesome art style, giving us a preview of the new systems, mainly the new rev system, and our first set of characters including a newcomer, and holy sh**, we're actually getting an English dub. This game looks gorgeous already, and I can't wait to see more of it before its release. It's slated for early next year, and I've never been more excited to return to Southtown. Of course, this might also mean that KOF 15 isn't getting a Season 3, but considering how packed the game is already, that's fine with me. 
Besides, this series needed a new game more, honestly. I mean, you don't just leave a cliffhanger like Garo's ending left and just leave it unresolved, right? I hope Capcom's listening, because they've got quite a few cliffhangers that are still hanging around. I'm the Quarter Guy, and until next time, the arcade is closed. Yeah, I've been playing through the Mega Man X Legacy Collection on stream since the year started, and I've been experiencing the good and the bad, from the what am I fighting for, to the burn to the ground, from the epic Sigma battles to the misery that was Gaten High Max. And despite all the inconsistency, one thing has remained a constant. The music slaps harder than X's titanium frame. Next time, Top 10 Mega Man X Stage Themes. It's game time! Hey everyone, QG here. If you enjoyed the video, please like, subscribe, leave a comment, and share the video around. Feel free to check out my Twitter and my Twitch streams, and consider supporting me through Patreon and donating to my Extra Life campaign to support Children's Wisconsin. Thanks for watching.